event. So it starts uh, April 11th, the Fair Housing Act actually turns 53 years old. So for 53 years, we have had regulation that we'll talk about um, that was signed into law in 1968 that is guiding um, the program for um, housing providers in the public and private sector to make sure that everyone has equal opportunity to housing. Those of you that are in the industry, I know you hear about fair housing, um, different uh, for housing laws, and it's an ever-changing world. And let's be honest with you know, if you're working in um, multifamily housing or affordable housing, it's an ever-changing world, especially when you're dealing with um, affordable housing because there's rules and regulations that are constantly changing. So um, sometimes fair housing can actually be um, very, um, it's one of those things that can sometimes be complicated, but it's also those times where I always teach in my trainings to not be fair housing scared. If you know the rules and regulations, then you, you have to know the rules and regulations first and then be able to apply them properly. So whether you've been in the industry for two weeks, two months, or 20 years, you should have fair housing training at least once a year. So again, I'm glad that you are um, joining me today for this fair housing segment um, as we take a walk through, um, through the rules and regulations. So as we make our way through talking about the different protected classes, um, I give you a number of different scenarios that we talk about as well as I'll even um, discuss a couple cases. I mean, and when I say a couple, those are just some that I've compiled. There's unfortunately hundreds and hundreds of cases of fair housing violations that um, are even still relevant to today. And it just comes out of lack of knowledge. That's all, it's, it's, it's lack of knowledge, it's ignorance of the law. But the good part is that's why you're here is to make sure you understand those rules and regulations going forward because fair housing violations come at a very um, high monetary cost to housing providers, okay? All right, everybody, so let's take a look at it. Grab your manual, please. Hold on, let me take one last look at my chat and make sure everything is good to go. All right, so let's turn now. Grab your manual, please, or access your manual by way of electronically, however you like to do that. Let's go ahead and let me click forward. All right, so as we do go through this training again, like I said, we are going to um, speak of the, um, the regulations that guide the Fair Housing Act. But the goal of this training, again, is to, to empower you, to give you the knowledge that you need to which you must understand those rules and regulations. But please do not um, take this training to be a substitution for legal counsel. And you will hear me talk quite a bit about understanding there are times where you will have to um, they're, they're, you're gonna, gonna hear me say there's no cookie cutter when we're dealing with fair housing and different um, scenarios that um, are presented your way. So there's no cookie cutter way to handle any one situation. All right, You'll, there are times you're gonna have to take those situations and handle them accordingly. But I do ask that you seek legal counsel, um, but do not use this training as a means for replacing legal counsel. And this is a good part with housing providers is they make sure they have strong legal teams um, on their side to work with them so that they are able um, to assist the housing providers to make sure that those rules and regulations are being adhered to. Okay. All right, everybody. So let's, let's uh, please grab your manual and turn to page number one, where we are now going to look at what is the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act, it says at the top of page one, it is the policy of the United States to provide within constitutional limitations for fair housing through the United States. No person shall, shall be subjected to discrimination because of their race, color, sex, handicap, familial status, or national origin in the sale, rental, or advertising um, of dwellings, in the provision of brokerage service, or in the availability of real estate related transactions. That is literally the caption from the Code of Re uh, Federal Regulations for HUD that speaks to the Fair Housing Act. Housing is tied to happiness. Those of us that are working in the affordable housing industry, we hear all the time or we've heard often where we must provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing. And this is a part of that mission to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing. With regards to HUD, you're going to hear me mention the HUD 
excuse me, the HUD agency, United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. And you will hear me mention the DOJ quite a bit, which is the Department of Justice. Those two, um, those two entities together, HUD and the DOJ, um, collectively, jointly, they enforce the Fair Housing Act, okay? So the Fair Housing Act is outlined by um, HUD regulations. It outlines exactly what is expected with regards to compliance. And then unfortunately, if there's a situation where a fair housing claim is brought, um, uh, is a reasonable claim that has been made for a fair housing violation, then the Department of Justice is the agency that will bring lawsuits on behalf of those particular individuals based on um, the references from HUD, okay? So you'll hear me mention HUD and the DLJ quite a bit. All right, and sticking with going through your manual and looking at the slides, it says the Civil Rights Act, we're going to start with the Civil Rights Act of 1886. And, you know, as you, as we go through the, the initial understanding the history of the Fair Housing Act, it's, it's an involvement. Not, I said involvement, but I meant evolvement. So it's an evolution of how it started out in 1866 to how it came to be in 1968 with, sign, with the signing of Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968. So the Civil Rights Act was enacted in 1866. This is right after too, the Civil War ended, which was just a year before in 1965. So the Civil Rights Act implemented the 13th Amendment abolishing um, slavery. It defined US citizenship and prov provided that all citizens were protected equally by US law with the enactment of the 14th Amendment. In, as a part of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, it says all citizens were legally given the right to inherit, purchase, lease, sell, hold, and convey real and, and personal property. Last one says this was the law of the land, but there were very weak enforcement provisions for decades and discrimination was extremely common. As the Civil Rights Act continued, many years continued to pass and it continued to evolve. We reached 1968 with the Civil Rights Act, which became known as Title VI. It says it prohibited discrimination of race, color, and national origin in federally funded programs. So this is where now we have, again, the evolution of the Civil Rights Act to cover housing that is provided for those programs that are receiving a federal subsidy from the government, such as HUD, okay, United States Department um, of Housing and Urban Development, which, which houses a number of different programs, um, Section 8, Housing Choice Voucher Holders, as well as the USDA. For those of you that aren't familiar, um, you may see USDA and think, well, isn't that the United States Department of Agriculture? You are absolutely correct. But for those of you that work with rural development properties, you may not, may not have any on this training, but there is um, a federally uh, subsidized program for housing that provides housing to uh, those that are living in rural areas throughout the United States and it is governed by that rural development program is governed by the United States Department of Agriculture. So that is a federally subsidized program. As the um, Civil Rights Act continued to evolve, we now reach 1968 where we look at the fair housing laws as it applies to both public and private housing. Again, the evolution of the civil rights coverage. So on page one, it says the Civil Rights Act of 1968, Title VIII, was passed April 11th, 1968. So remember earlier, I mentioned to you that the Fair Housing Act turns 53 years old on the 11th. And I think, what's today? Today is the sixth. So in five days, it turns 53 years old. It was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson. This is also Title VIII became known as the Fair Housing Act. Now, I just want to take a uh, segue here for a second to uh, mention Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because he was a very important figure with regards to the passage of the um, Fair Housing Act because he advocated for many years for equality in housing. And he passed, he was assassinated actually on April 4, and a week later, Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Fair Housing Law into Congress. When we reach, um, so under the original coverages, federal acts for the, the Fair Housing Act, Title VIII listed race, color, religion, and national origin as the original five, okay? So one, two, three, four, I said, I said five, but I meant four, of the uh, coverages that were listed for um, 
the, the, uh, as a part of the seven federal protected classes. But then along came the final three, which in 1974, sex was added as a federally protected class. And then in 1988, again, the program is evolving. In 1988, uh, familial status and handicap were added to the um, act as well. Now, I do want to say that we, um, you know, it is more, um, I guess a better term that we use these days is disability or disabled as opposed to handicap, but we do have this here because handicap is written in the original uh, legislation for those seven federally protected classes, but it's just, um, you know, one of those uh, term, the term disabled or disability is preferred to handicap. At the very bottom of page number one, in addition to, there's, there's guidance there for you to be able to look up any additional protected classes. So under the Fair Housing Act, there are seven federal protected classes that we will take a detailed walkthrough coming up here in a second. But it's important for you to know that you have to be aware as, as being a housing provider, working with prospects, working with leads, working with residents, you um, have to, in addition to knowing the seven federally protected classes, you need to know what your state and local fair housing protected classes are as well. We've listed at the bottom of the manual on page one, how you can um, locate and identify based off of your state and your county, what those particular um, classes are. So the Fair Housing Act was amended just going from 1968 to 1988 where it says here is the policy of the United States to provide within constitutional limitations for fair housing through the United States. No person, now this is the, this is the, covers all of the seven federally protected classes. No person shall be subjected to discrimination because of their race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familiar status, or national origin in the sale, rental, or advertising of dwellings, in the provision of brokerage service, or the availability of real estate um, related transactions. So we are covering fair housing and all of those different, all of those different classes in those particular areas, both public and private housing. Again, HUD, along with the Department of Justice, is responsible for enforcing the Fair Housing Act. This is just a slide that does speak to what I mentioned at the bottom of page one with regards to understanding you are not just responsible for knowing your seven federal protected classes, but you are responsible for knowing the um, local and state um, coverages as well, because they could have different um, different uh, protected classes. Some of them could be sexual orientation, marital status, source of income, ancestry, creed. So you must know them all. On page number two, now we're going to look and start to delve more into understanding discrimination, how it applies, how the the, the Fair Housing Act. Um, wants us to be aware of these protected classes. And we're going to talk about, um, just talk about, so give some examples in detail with regards to these different protected classes. So discrimination, what is discrimination? Basically, no one should be denied the opportunity to rent, purchase, sell, or finance housing due to who they are, what they look like, what they believe, or where they are from. The Fair Housing Act is aiming to end discrimination. Oh, please, let me go there. When we speak of discrimination and, and it tells us what it is and what is allowed of these, these freedoms, it's, 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 it's promoting freedom of choice is what it's doing. It says here on this slide, fair housing allows people to choose where they want to live and ensure fair treatment for all. And you're going to hear me mention a lot about consistency and policy. So between HUD and the DOJ, consistency, policy, all of these aid in understanding the law and applying them so that you do not find yourself in a fair housing um, situation, fair housing violation situation. Illegal discrimination right here results when we violate the rights of a person based on protected classes. And a lot of times this is nothing, you know, fair housing violations are nothing a lot of times that are intentional. You know, we unfortunately, we do have individuals out there that intentionally discriminate regardless of the law. And they, that it usually catches up with them, but there are a lot of times there, you know, violations occur just because the person didn't know. And that's not acceptable for, um, for the enforcing the, the fair housing 
Act. So this is why I'm glad you're on the training so that everybody can know what those rules and regulations are. There are seven federal protected classes. One is race. Then we have religion, color, national origin, sex, and sexes in male and female, disability, and familial status. And we're actually going to talk to um, about some new legislation that um, came out of the Biden administration back in February with regards to sexual um, discrimination. Because again, remember that we're evolution. The rules, rules and regulations are not made, created to, you know, it's a basis for compliance, but it evolves and it changes. And we see a lot of changes all the time with regards to uh, fair housing law. So I'll talk about that as we get closer to it. Here's some common examples I've given you just a few earlier when I said they are outside of the seven federal protected classes, but nonetheless, they may apply for your state and local government. You need to know them. Examples can be those public assistance recipients, creator and excuse me, ancestry, marital status, sexual orientation, source of income, the LGBT community, LGBT individuals, persons with LE, uh, LEP, we say limited English proficiency, so, and survivors of domestic violence. So all of these can be examples of additional protected classes in your state and local government that you are responsible for being, um, for knowing what those classes are. All right, so who does the Fair Housing Act protect? Well, we've seen here race, color, religion, national origin, and sex. Guess what? All of these are, these are considered universal classes. Why? Because they apply to all of us. However, when we look at familial status and disability, these do not apply to all of us. Not everyone is disabled. Not everyone has, has a child or children or in the process of, of adopting a child or taking in foster children. So some apply, these apply to all of us while these do not apply to all of us. Now let's take a walk through each of these seven federally protected classes. We're gonna start with race. If you look in your manual on page two, it says race is a group of people. I did, this is the definition, a group of people identified as distinct from other groups because of supposed physical or genetic traits shared by a group, such as you could be African-American, Caucasian, Asian, national, na Native American, it's what you identify with. As a housing provider, it's important for you to understand you must avoid asking about race. When we, you, are qualifying individuals for housing at your property, race should never ever be a factor. It's not a thing. You apply the rules and regulations of the different programs, whether it's HUD, um, the tax credit program, rural development, home funds, you apply the rules of those programs and you apply them accordingly to the individuals. And if they meet those qualifications, then they are approved for housing at your property. However, I do want to say and point out that federally funded housing, there is an exception to the rule about asking about race, but I want to be very clear when I say that. HUD has um, HUD and the uh, Rural Development Program exclusively want to gather, want you to gather demographic information about your applicants that are applying for housing um, at those particular properties that have that type of funding. And the reason for this is because if those of you that are familiar with the Affirmative Fair Housing Marketing Plan, it goes back to making sure that you are um, reaching out to those individuals in, in that area who are least likely to, to apply. So they're making sure that you understand your commitment to non-discrimination. So a part of the application process is gathering this information from your applicant. It's not mandatory that they provide that to you, okay? It is optional. We do include it, a lot of times it is included as a, uh, an additional um, addendum or additional form that is given to your applicant to complete, but they don't have to complete it. But we do try and get this information. Again, we have to, you are responsible for demonstrating to your state housing finance, or sorry, we're demonstrating to the different program monitors that you are adhering to non-discrimination in housing. You are reaching out to those who at least likely to apply, but be very careful not to confuse the applications because the tax credit program does not require the actual regulations for tax credit doesn't say you have to gather 
the information about race. Now, your state housing finance agencies that govern the tax credit program, they may ask that you do so. That may be a requirement in their state, but the regulations do not speak to a requirement of that. So be very careful to not confuse your applications, which means you want you only want to ask what that particular program monitor provider based on the regulations wants you to gather for those particular programs. That's that's what that different that's what that statement is for. Okay. Now let's move on to look at color of skin. So even within a race, people may be treated differently based on the color of their skin. Look in your manual page two. It says the lightness or darkness of one's skin among certain racial groups. This is the definition of color of skin. Color prejudice and discrimination is closely aligned with racial prejudice and discrimination. So basically, literally the color of your skin, dark, light, medium, olive tone. We are not to discriminate based on the color of someone's skin. Let's look at the next protected class, which is religion. Let's look at the manual bottom of page number two. It says it is illegal for a housing provider to discriminate against tenants based on their religious beliefs, or guess what, lack thereof. So we don't discriminate against someone based on what they believe, or there's some people who do not believe in a religion. We don't discriminate against those individuals. Um, so let me read it again. It's illegal for a housing provider to discriminate against tenants based on religious beliefs or lack thereof affiliation, observances, or practices. Housing providers also cannot take legal action against tenants or penalize them in any way because they disapprove of their religious involvement or affiliation. The Fair Housing Act ensures that all persons have access. Here we go back to the whole basis of understanding providing decent, safe, and sanitary housing where they can express their right to worship or even not to worship as they choose. You may have someone who is Christian, may have Christian faith, Jewish, um, Catholic, Islamic, okay? So everyone has that, that religious, is offered that religious freedom as a protection under the, the Fair Housing Act. I do wanna spend a little bit of time here and be very specific with regards, I want you to turn to page three, please, in your manual, because I want to spend a little bit of time here and be very specific about religious discrimination and delve into that just a little bit more. It says at the top of page three, you want to be careful about holidays and religious decorations. So as it says on the slide here, it's guidance for you when planning for the holidays, such as gathering, um, such as a gathering or you're decorating, it is important to make sure you are inclusive. That's another word you'll hear a lot throughout this training. And inclusive means you want to think of everyone in your community and make sure that the gathering that you're planning is welcoming for everyone. You don't want anyone singled out to make them feel like they are not a part of it or that you're not recognizing um, a particular uh, holiday. Now let's look on page number three because there's some very valuable information here that I want to look at. And then I'm going to um, also take a moment and look at the uh, Will Hoyt policy with regards to religion. Top of page three, it says the Fair Housing Act applies to any and all holiday time periods. So it's important to understand that the Fair House, understand the Fair Housing Act and its intent. Because if you understand the act and its intent, then you can properly apply it. It says apartment communities are made up of many different people with many different religious and cultural backgrounds. When planning for holidays, just want to reiterate it again. When planning for the holidays, such as a gathering or decorating it or decorating, it is important to think of everyone. Be inclusive, please. Think of everyone in the community. Plan a welcoming gathering for all. Specifically, here's some guidance from um, an actually it was a HUD memorandum that did speak to. Um, advertising um, with regards to during the holiday time and how as advice to um, property owners how to handle these particular situations and remain fair housing compliant. It says the use of secularized terms or symbols relating to religious holidays such as Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, or St. Valentine's Day images or phrases such as Merry Christmas or Happy Easter or the like, please note, Specifically, the HUD regulation says it does not constitute a violation of the act by using these particular secularized terms or symbols. However, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, has suggested that landlords use secularized terms or symbols aimed 
at spreading holiday cheer rather than observing a specific religion. That's why I'll, I'll say, I'll use Christmas as an example. This is why we typically say, you know, when we're interacting with our residents, our applicants, happy holidays, okay? We don't just single out Merry Christmas. You may have someone that uh, addresses you with Merry Christmas, but when we are inclusive for um, everyone at the community, well, a lot of times we will use happy holidays, okay? So again, the act is saying that, the, you know, using those terms doesn't um, constitute a violation, but they do heavily suggest that they use those terms or symbols aimed at making sure that they, you're just spreading the cheer as, a, as, as opposed to narrowing it down and observing a specific um, religion. You want residents to have um, a happy and festive time. Be sure to avoid emphasizing certain religions or religion in general. That's just keeping it safe, okay? Let's talk about common areas because this is, this is a topic that everyone needs to be aware of with religious observances, someone's religious black background, their preference, and our common areas at our communities, at our properties. It says your community may have common areas that are used by your residents, such as clubhouses, game rooms, sitting areas, etc. Whatever your policy is, or whatever your policies are regarding the usage of these areas, be sure that they are all, please circle that word or take note of that word, neutral. Make sure that the policies you have in place are neutral, okay? Neutral is not narrowing down, honing in on one specific religion or, or lack of religion. It is keeping it neutral, which means it's going to keep it consistent, it's going to be inclusive. Your policy should allow for religious activities of any faith to be permitted to the same extent as non-religious activities in common areas. Now, if someone suggests or requests, not suggests, requests to reserve the common area for an activity, it should not be limited because it is not appropriate for the rest of the residents, okay? So if someone wants to, to reserve the community, uh, the community area, community room, for a particular activity, you can't say, oh, well, you know, we've got a majority of this particular uh, religious sector here that lives at the property. I don't want to offend anyone, so I don't think we should do that. No, your common areas are to be open to everyone to utilize it as they see fit, mind you, keeping um, adhering to the rules of usage of that particular area, because as housing providers, we do have to enforce our, our lease. And you know, use of the community room, it does come with certain rules and regulations to make sure that there's no damage is what I'm getting around to. So, you know, we all of you that are on this training, you may not be have that job title asset manager, but we are asset managers because we have to make sure that we protect the asset for the owners. So you want to make sure um, that you're not limiting what they're allowed to use the community room based on what your beliefs are. The limit should only be for disturbance activity, for instance, such as being too loud. That's in your lease, right? You have to have protections that are in your lease. All the limits should be equal for every resident. So whatever those limitations are, need to be applied across the board. Please know your policy, know what your company policy is. And it's important that your company have solid um, policies in place. Written policies are vital to effective compliance and need to be solidly based on fair housing law and what I just mentioned, not based on what you feel is best, not based on your personal opinion. Before we move on to another, um, the next protected class, I do want to take a moment to look at the, um, I have a, a, uh, an example here on my slide, the religious material policy for Will Hoyt properties. And, you know, as I read through this policy, it's, it's a great policy that they have to make sure that they have covered um, individuals, those that they've covered themselves as an owner, and they're making sure that you all are aware of what the rules and regulations are that you must apply at the properties where you work, at the properties where you manage. So this entire policy encourages equal opportunity, equal opportunity for your residents at your property to which to utilize certain things at the property. I don't want, I'm not going to read through it. Um, to its entirety, but it is, I'm sure it has been provided to you by management. If not, I'm sure um, Melissa will make sure that everyone has a copy of it. I just want to point out a few things and it is a copy in your manual as well, but it's um, on page number four, the second paragraph where it says, with respect to religious materials, because now we're going to talk about the, this is specifically 
talking about the religious materials policy and the policy of Will Hoyt again is encouraging equal opportunity. So with respect to religious materials and materials with religious themes, the company shall allow, and I want you to make sure you take note of that, shall allow residents to display religious materials of any faith on the same basis as they can display non-religious materials. So again, equal opportunity for everyone for those that have a particular religious theme, as opposed to someone who wants to display something that doesn't have a, a particular religious theme. The next um, point I wanted to bring out was in the third paragraph where it says religious materials of any faith, including religious publications, shall also be permitted to the same extent as non-religious materials. Note where this is in common areas. So we've gone from being able to display them to also having them in your common areas, okay? For example, residents shall be permitted to uh, contribute religious materials, all faiths, all faiths. I said that wrong. It sounded like I said faiths, didn't it? All faiths to a property's library on the same extent as residents are permitted to contribute non-religious materials, okay? The last paragraph there says, in addition to, and I'm not reading it word for word because it is here for your reference, but it's very important to, it's a very important part of religious discrimination and understanding how to not violate this particular uh, protected class. But um, another point I wanted to bring out was the very last paragraph where it says, in addition, residents shall be permitted to host or participate in religious activities such as Bible studies. They can do these in common areas on the same basis as non-religious activities such as parties or book studies. So, or, or um, book studies, or, or, and I, I'm saying this, emphasizing again, going back to religious material policy, these are the policies that you want to have at your company because you they, they aid in compliance, they help protect you, they help protect the owner. So I encourage you to make sure that you are aware of what your entire policies are for um, applying them to your property and giving those, um, creating, making sure that you adhere to in, uh, providing equal opportunity for everyone, whether they're of a religious, uh, particular religious background, or even if they're not. It says, it's very specific on that, that form where it says any questions about the policy could be directed to the customer service number that are listed there below. So I'm sure um, there it'll be this, if this information hasn't already been provided to you, it definitely will be. And you want to make sure whether you've been at the property for 20 years or you have someone who just started two days ago, make sure that everyone is aware of what the rules and regulations are for the company policy, because we have to all maintain the asset for the owners of our properties, okay? All right, everybody, the next protected class is national origin. Now, national origin, top of page five. So we've moved past the religious discrimination um, protected class. So we're gonna look at national origin. This refers to the place one's or of one's origin or the country where one's ancestors are from. So. When we're talking about national origin, you must be very sensitive. When I say very, I should take out the word very. You wanna be sensitive to language issues. This is now you're going to start hearing me talk about that LEP, limited English proficiency language, because I want for you to make sure you're aware of it in case you weren't, there is no official language in the United States, all right? So English is not, while a majority of people that you feel in the United States speak English, English is not the official language of the United States. All right, so there's no official language in the US, but we must be prepared to deal with individuals who do not speak your language. And I know that HUD has very specific policies um, with regards to limited English proficiency, being able to have um, an LEP plan to make sure, which is limited uh, access plan so that you can communicate with those individuals who do not speak your language or the language that will say do not speak your language. So in other words, if you have an applicant who um, or a prospect who calls up or is interested in coming, you know, they come walk into the clubhouse, they wanna find out information about your community, you can't turn them away and say, look, you need to go get a translator because I don't speak the English that you don't speak English and I don't speak your language. I need you to be able to speak my language for me to communicate with you. That's not what we do. That's not in the spirit of 
of making sure that we offer equal opportunity, which is what the Fair Housing Act provides coverage for. We are responsible for um, having a plan to make sure individuals in place to make sure we could communicate with those who do not speak English, even down to if we have to deny their application because based off of the uh, compliance criteria or the rules and regulations of a specific program, they did not meet those. Even if we have to deny the application, we still need to be able to, we are responsible for communicating with those individuals and letting them, you know, treating them fairly, treating them the exact same way as someone who speaks the language in which we understand. So we must be, we must have be prepared to deal with those individuals who do not speak our language. And again, that LEP language is straight from HUD. Um, it says HUD funded property managers must be aware of LEP requirements, okay? But it's not just limited, it's very specific with HUD because remember HUD enforces the Fair Housing Act, but even if you're not dealing with the HUD property, rural development has limit, limited English proficiency requirements. The LIHTC program, you need to be able to communicate with those individuals as well because we have to be able, we are in the business of providing decent, safe and sanitary housing. The next protected class is sex and sex. We're going to look at that on page five is gender being male or female treating men differently other than women that can fall into sexual discrimination. So violation of, of sexual discrimination, violation of sex based off of sexual discrimination, treating men differently than women. It also includes sexual harassment, which is defined as repeated persuade pervasive, excuse me, um, and offensive conduct or behavior of a sexual nature. Now HUD has now determined that the Fair Housing Act's prohibition on sex discrimination and housing likewise includes discrimination on the basis too of sexual orientation and gender identity. And that is a great segue into discussing the new regulation that was issued by the Biden administration just um, on February 11th. I actually have um, some screenshots of the regulations here. It's actually a three page document. If you were to um, Google the, the actual subject here, I should, I'm circling that. I'm sorry, I should be right here. If you were to Google this, you'll be able to pull up the full regulations, but it does say on January 20th of 2020, President Biden issued an executive order and this order has, has further defined, again, I go back to that word I used when we first met, evolution the evolution of the Fair Housing Act and further as, as time goes on, as years continue to pass, their life is happening and different things are occurring in life that need to be addressed. And this is one where, um, uh, it, actually this, this legislation came out of three different cases, but there's one specifically um, that, that I'll mention as regard to Bostick versus Clayton County. However, if you look on the slide, it says January 2020, President Biden issued an executive order on preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. So this case came about because of an employer um, discriminated in this particular case that I'm mentioning here, Bostick versus Clayton, Bostick versus Clayton County. It was where it was a case about an employer that discriminated against a gentleman who was a longtime employee. And over time, he decided, okay, so he's worked at this company, longtime employee, he's doing his thing, minding his business. His life, his decision was he wanted to participate in a gay recreational softball league. That's his choice. But the owner didn't, didn't like that, didn't like the fact that he wanted to participate in a gay recreational softball league. So the employer decided that they were gonna let him go. And they made a very, very big mistake by doing so because this case did go all the way to the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court heard this ruling where it goes back to further understanding and defining sex. When we look at the, the federal protected classes, sex is defined as, as male. When we look at gender, we're looking male and female, but this, the ruling now went, went further to go back and look at those coverages when we do say sex as a protected class. And I wanna read further into this, this, this letter, this legislation here. It says, then the decision with Bostick versus Clayton County held that the prohibitions 
against sex discrimination, this is in the workplace, okay, because it's right about here, in the workplace contained in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, extended to and included discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. So they went all the way back to 1964 when the, the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act included sex as a protected class. The Supreme Court decided that it extended, this was that protection of sex extended to include discrimination on the basis of sexual discrimination and gender identity. Again, and this is specific to, to understanding about um, how it works, it, the protections in the workplace. At the very, um, one of the other points I just wanted to point out, it says at the core of this department, so the HUD, depart, um, HUD agency's mission um, is to ensure that all people peaceably, and I'm right around here, peacefully enjoy a place that they call home where they are safe and can and thrive free from discrimination and fear. So effective immediately, the Fair Housing Economic Opportunity shall accept for filing and investigate all complaints of sex discrimination, including discrimination because of gender identity or sexual orientation that meet other jurisdictional requirements. So guess what? These protections, again, does exceed. It's under the Fair Housing Act, but you have to be careful when we're looking at employment as well and understanding what those rules and regulations are, what, what are those protected classes? What do those protected classes mean? They give you the do's and the don'ts. So um, again, I encourage you to be aware um, about sexual discrimination too in the workplace. Make sure that you, um, if you want to look at this, print this you know, for your, your future reference, here is the subject line that you'll want to put in your Google search to help you pull up this legislation. But um, it was uh, made effective February 11th of 2021. All right, so let's move on to the last, or almost the last protected class. This one, as the Fair Housing Act evolved, 1988, we added familial status. Actually, gonna, familial status and handicap were added. It says families with, now when we talk about familial status, well, let me read from the manual page five. It says families with children under 18, regardless of age or number of children, pregnant women, persons in the process of securing legal custody of children under age 18, occupancy limits should be based on the number of occupants, regardless of age. Owners are allowed to impose reasonable occupancy rental standards based on local, state, or federal restrictions. Okay, so there, go back to occupancy limits occupancy standards based on landlord tenant laws your state and local laws but when you are are housing applicants number one you're looking at what their need is what you have available and what the rules and regulations of the program are to which to qualify them for housing not the fact that they are a family that they have seven children and you're like oh my god these children are going to totally destroy my nice and peaceful neighborhood my community can't do that. You are not allowed to do that. If you do that, that will be a fair housing violation of familial status. Um, let me see here. This speaks to what I just spoken about with knowing what your occupancy limits are, because you do have to abide by those, but you do not, um, you place those individuals based off of what their need is, what you have available, and the rules and regulations of a particular program, depending on what is in place at your community. Each family has the right to prove themselves. There are though um, three exceptions with regards to housing that are allowed and they wanna be very specific with these because it's, and these are for programs such as the Rural Development Program under HUD and the um, HUD agency. It says all persons, we're looking at elderly housing. So three exceptions allowed for elderly housing. And it says all persons that are 62 years of age or older. So we have senior housing for this age group. And then we have housing where it says one person must be 55 or older in each of the units and the rural development, these programs, um, rural development at HUD are federally assisted property. So they are, these are specific exceptions to the protected class with regards to housing that is allowed for elderly housing. For these particular uh, federally funded properties, when we look at senior housing, it gives us the very specific definitions of when it says all persons 62 years of age or older, it says head 
co-head is 62 or older or disabled. Again, this is being very specific to the particular programs. Families are allowed as long as this is true. So just understanding, again, looking at the chart that we have, or not chart, it's like a, a little flow chart in a sense, I guess, on page number five that does speak to how this applies and what the exceptions are for federally uh, funded programs such as rural development or, or HUD. All right, let's look at this, HUD equal access final rule. So HUD issued a program rule in 2012 and it was called the housing or titled the housing notice 2015-06 on July 13th of 2015 and it granted protections to all individuals and families regardless of their actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender or marital status. So this was yet again, a, a evolution of the Fair Housing Act and HUD requirements allowing equal access. So equal access to housing, regardless of sexual orientation, gender or marital status. The regulation we looked at prior to it that was signed by the Biden administration just in, um, enacted in February was making sure we understood about applying the um, non-discrimination rules based off of uh, a gender identity or sexual orientation in employment to make sure we understand those rules that they do apply and you can't discriminate as an employer against someone based on sexual orientation or gender identity. And it fell under that um, protected class of sex. It falls under, I should say. All right, let's see here. What's my next slide? Oh, we get to handicap now. That's the last one, last protected class. And again, like I said, in the original regulation, it listed handicap. But if you notice in the manual, I have handicap on my slide, I have disability because, you know, the term disabled is preferred to handicap. But here's the definition of what handicap disabled means. It's a person with a physical or mental impairment, which substantially limits one or more major life's activities a record of having such an impairment or being regarded as having such an impairment. This, this is direct regulations from, um, from the HUD guidance that, that defines what a disability is. It's important to know at the bottom of page five, it says, while a person who meets the definition of disability is defined by the Social Security Administration for the purpose of getting supplemental security income or Social Security disability, in most cases, it meets the definition under the Fair Housing Act, but the reverse may not be true. So in other words, if an individual who was not approved for a social security disability will be approved for fair housing. There are two different things because we know social security is that financial um, offering assistance financially to the household. So it's possible that a claim can be denied. However, based on specific definition of what a disability is, Fair housing is different from fair housing laws and fair housing will look at if the person meets this definition, then they are considered disabled under the fair housing law. So that's what this particular, this what this means here on the slide and at the bottom of page number five. All right, so let's look further at disability. Turn to page number six. The slide's not gonna match up with that, but just turn to page six and stay there for a second. Persons with disabilities, here are some definitions of what those major life's activities would be if it is um, impaired ba based on self-care, manual tasks, walking, breathing, seeing, hearing, speaking, learning, working, physical or mental impairment, development disability, um, speech or hearing impairment, heart disease, alcoholism, emotional illness, drug addiction, and mental retardation. But I do want to make sure we understand when I say drug addiction here, it says when we're talking about drug addiction, it does not, when, when defining what a disability is, drug addiction does not include current users, current is the key word here, users of drug and alcohol who, who use prevents them from meeting the requirements of the lease or prevents a direct threat to the property or safety of others. So this is, when we talk about disability, it's former um, drug or alcohol use and not current. And we'll get more into that when we start talking about um, the different uh, coverages under disability. So we're going to look, turn to page six, we're going to look at a number of different uh, fair housing prohibitions. So under Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, 
We have um, several prohibited acts and we're going to talk about affirmative requirements. So those affirmative requirements speak to your reasonable accommodation and reasonable modification. And is that, it is at that time where we will talk about, of course, we get to talk about those fun um, emotional support and companion animals, but we'll save that for a little bit later because we will certainly get there. With regards to, sorry, click too fast, fair housing acts that are prohibited, we're going to go through all nine of these and we're going to start with block busting on page number six. So when we're looking at block busting, it's defined as a practice in which to falsely inform that people who are members of a protected class, such as race, religion, or national origin will be moving into their neighborhood. The purpose of this, unfortunately, is a negative purpose because it induces fear mongering by use of bigotry and prejudice. So as we take a walk through these, I want you to focus on these are um, prohibited acts. These are things that, that you can't do. Please don't do them. So when we look at blockbusting, I want you to think of it as um, there is a particular, you know, if we could say we don't want, this isn't going to be probably a good area for you to live because those people, note my little bunny ears here, those people are going to be um, moving into the neighborhood, all right? So you're, you're spreading fear amongst those individuals that let's say you're in the process, you're trying to sell a home and you're a realtor and this is, this is what you're telling them. Well, you probably don't wanna live here because those people are, um, live in this neighborhood or it could be on the opposite side where they're, they could you know, be encouraging you falsely, giving you this information so that you can go ahead and sell for cheaper, all right? To not move into this particular neighborhood because it's using bigotry and prejudice based off of discrimination against a particular race, religion, or nas national origin. Steering, the next one says, this is the practice that involves limiting the housing options available to an applicant by guiding or steering them towards or away from a particular neighborhood building or floor within a building based on the individual's protected class. So steering, you know, let's say you, you have, first of all, it is a prohibited act, but let's say someone just doesn't know and we have a prospect um, and his family that walks into the clubhouse and they're interested, you know, they, they pass the community all the time. It's on a, a route that's close to the grocery store, to shopping malls, it's even close to a place of work and they can picture themselves living there. So they come to your community with their family and they are interested, you know, in, um, living there and you realize that they've got one, two, three, four, oh my, they've got six children. You start counting, you're like, mm, maybe this is not gonna be the best neighborhood for them. So I'm just going to direct them at a neighborhood where my friend lives and she has four children and they love it there because it's a, it's a, a nice community and it's a lot of kids that live there. So you steer them away from your community to somewhere else. That's just one example of steering and you don't want to do it. Remember, fair housing is non-discrimination and housing, that person is allowed to decide where they want to live based on what their determination is, not what you have determined. And based on the fact, yes, they must qualify for the program at your particular property. So please avoid steering. Redlining is the practice, you know, this is actually a very old practice that dates back to 1930. Quite simply, it does say, um, it's where it draws, a, let me read from it, the practice of drawing a red line around certain neighborhoods that have a high concentration of a particular protected class, then limiting services to those who apply within the red line. So this was actually a government practice that dated back to the 1930s. Um, and literally the government drew lines on major maps and colored those lines with some of those neighborhoods in red. It, therefore, it basically labeled, labeled those communities basically a hazard, okay? So hazardous communities in which banking, um, lending institutions would um, not want to, to provide particular types of funding for housing for particular individuals, because in these particular areas, it might have been a high presence of African American, even European immigrants that were there. So it was called redlining. And at one point, again, like I said, the government did this back in the 30s. But then as a part of the Fair Housing Act, it became 
a discrimination. It was part of discriminating. It is a prohibited act that is no longer allowed. Now, here we are when I said, um, you know, again, it, 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 it puts um, a, a red lining around a certain neighborhood that has a high concentration of say African-American or even those of European descent. And from some of the research I've, I've learned, it was especially, they did that with the Jewish community as well. And so um, it does limit services to those particular neighborhoods that are within those red lines. And here we are, oh gosh, what, 80, forgive me for not being able to count, 80 years later, maybe from 1930s, 80 years, a little bit more, 90 years, I guess. Um, the effects of redlining are still very much out there because we still have communities that are no longer redlined that once were redlined, but those communities are suffering because they just do not have um, still to this day um, the access to certain services. Um, is the services to those particular neighborhoods are limited. So that is a prohibited um, act. The next one, refusing to rent or deal with prospects. Here's what you must do with all of your prospects, your applicants. Everyone gets an application, okay? Will everyone qualify to live at your community? Probably, maybe, maybe not. Not always, I should say. I think that's better for me to say, will everyone qualify to live at, at your property? Not always. However, we are not to cherry pick who we want to give an application to based on where they come from, what they look like, okay? Everyone gets an application. We treat everyone the same. We do the same background checks, rental background, uh, uh, credit history, whatever your requirement is and your occupancy policy is what you follow for everyone. Denials are made after facts are gathered. You are not to, to size someone up and say, mm, I don't think they're gonna be able to pay afford our rent. You're not allowed to do that. You treat everyone equally, okay? If you go through the application process with that applicant and if something doesn't meet your, your occupancy standard, then of course that is okay to deny their application because they didn't meet the requirements of the program, not based on the fact that you prejudged them and thought, you know, had one thought or the other and chose to treat them differently based on what, say for instance, maybe they look like. Maybe they didn't come in dressed as nicely as you thought and so you're thinking well is that person homeless it's not our decision to that's not how we place individuals for housing scripts are helpful in presenting a consistent message so scripts meaning it is okay if you have i like to call them a canned response same thing script canned response where everyone in the front office who comes in contact with prospects leads residents applicants you're saying the same thing to everyone. You don't want to cherry pick what you say. Let's, let's say you have a prospect comes in. That prospect is decked down from head to toe. They look nice. They smell good. Now their hair out of place. They've got on nice shoes. They have a nice watch. They've got a nice handbag. They probably pulled up in the latest Tesla model and parked it in your future residence guest spot. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, I don't think I'm going to have to go through you know, the same process with this individual, I think they're gonna be okay. As to someone who probably didn't come in with all of those those, those things that adorned them and, and spoke, you know, of how well or not they take care of themselves. It's okay to make sure, you, you cannot do that. It's not okay to treat individuals separately. You, I mean, differently. And you, it's okay to have a script when you're talking to these applicants, um, these prospects, for gathering the information that you need. This is why you will hear me say two forms. Forms are so important at your property because forms aid in consistency. If you have forms in place as a part of, let's just say your application packet, you guarantee that everybody's gonna see the same thing, okay? And if you do have to ask a question, then you're just asking a question of clarification. But as you are answering the phone, greeting traffic that comes into the, the um, clubhouse, you wanna make sure everyone is saying the same thing, whether that's by way of a canned response, canned response or script, you just wanna make sure that you're consistent with how you address either your telephone prospects or your foot traffic, okay? Be careful how you answer prospects or questions from prospects, such as what kind of people do you rent to here? Are there a lot of children that live here? What are the neighbors like? 
As much as we would want to answer these questions with candor, we can't, you don't want to. Here's what I mean too, by having a script. We are an equal opportunity housing provider. And here's three different responses that you can have for all of those questions. Anyone who passes our credit criminal and income checks, okay? So they would be approved because we are an equal opportunity housing provider. We welcome anyone who meets our qualifying standards. We have a diverse community with many different backgrounds. You are allowed to say these to those questions that might be asked and leave it at that. You don't want to let them know that there are a lot of children. You know, you know, the question is say, well, you know, are there a lot of kids that live here? And your answer be, oh my God, yes, you should be here every day at 3.30 when the bus drops them off. Oh my God, just scatter all over the community. You see it, but you don't want to say that. Let that person decide based on their observation, is this going to be a good neighborhood for myself and or myself and my family to live? They are responsible for making that decision based again on what you have available, what their need is, and are they going to meet the rules and regulations of the particular pro program in place at your community? All right. We're about 20 minutes away from my very first break. So you all hang in there with me. Discriminatory co conditions or terms. Here's what this one speaks to. Making sure that you are consistent with regards to your rental terms, any fees that you may charge, deposits that you um, charge, inspections, photos, evictions, and infractions. So in other words, your rental terms, fees, deposits, all of those should be the same straight across the board, not based on a particular, looking at a particular race um, or national origin and saying, well, you know, I might be better off charging different deposits, having different rental terms. That is flat out discrimination, which will put you on the opposite side of the Fair Housing Act. And that's not where you want to be. Make sure you have a procedure in place as your management practice from the time when it says here inspections and photos to what is your procedure from the time a resident gives a notice to vacate to turning in the keys, you locking the unit your uh, maintenance team going to, to punch the unit, turn the unit, taking pictures of any damage. What is your procedure? That must be consistent for every single resident that you have that's decided that they're going to move on, okay? And you have to handle evictions and infractions the same way, all right? So you just must be consistent. Um, the next one is denying availability. I should say falsely denying availability. So the term available must be defined. The correct person should answer all questions about availability. So in other words, this is why, and we'll talk about the role of maintenance coming up here soon, um, because it's important for everyone to know what their role is at the property. And when I say maintenance, maintenance comes in contact with residents and potential prospects even more than those of you that work in the front office. And why? Because they're always out on the grounds. They're always out at the property, keeping the property looking decent and keeping that curb appeal up. So, you know, they are um, interact with residents and prospects more than you do, but it's important that they know what their role is. And I'll get to that as we get, you know, I think in another slide or two to direct all of those availability questions to, to individuals in the front office. But it's important that everyone in the front office is, is um, on the same page. You may have a different um, management practice at your community. I remember, uh, I always liken it to when I was on the other side of the uh, work tax credit. That was my start in the affordable housing industry. And I know we would print the availability report every day and we'd have a fresh availability report Everyone who was in the front office was very aware of what was available because why we want to make sure we are consistent. That's why I spoke earlier and said fair housing violations are not always intent. It's just lack of not knowing the rules and regulations. And you want to make sure that you are giving the correct information, the same information, correct information out to everyone who calls or walks in, you know, to inquire about availability. And you do not want to falsely give someone um, tell someone what is available because, you know, you didn't lo like how they talked to you on the telephone or they sounded like they were from a particular national origin or they came in and they just didn't look neat and tidy. And so you falsely tell them what's available and say, no, maybe we'll have something available next month, check back again. And then the next person comes in, you know, you roll out the red carpet for them to be able to show them 
showcase the property. So hopefully they'll lease. That's what you do not want to do. Professionalism is vital in all areas. So be very careful. Discriminatory advertising and financing. So when discriminatory advertising, we'll talk about that later on in the day with regards to training because it speaks to what's, what must not be used. So in other words, when you are advertising, your focus is always on the amenities of the property and not the particular type of people you are trying to attract. You cannot um, give the impression that discrimination is acceptable through your advertising by advertising saying we are property um, where no kids are allowed. Now, again, if you are, um, there are those particular exceptions to housing with regards to elderly housing, but you can't just arbitrarily say, well, we don't want the kids here. So we're gonna throw that in our ad. We don't want it. Discriminatory financing. This one re relates primarily to financing and lenders. It's unlawful to discriminate in the provision of brokerage services or residential real estate transactions. So again, the Fair Housing Act covers public and private housing. Now, the last one speaks to intimidation, interference, or coercion. It says to keep persons from pursuing the full benefit of the law. This is what happens when intimidation, interference, or coercion occurs. It is illegal to retaliate against, threaten, or act in any manner to intimidate someone because he or she has exercised rights under um, the fair housing law. So, when we talk about, if you look on page six at the last paragraph, it says it is illegal to retaliate against an employer, um, employee or tenant who opposes employment practices that discriminate based on sex for filing a discrimination charge, for testifying and for participation in investigation of a discrimination charge. So we at federally funded um, properties and the light tech program adopts the, the fair, housing law, uh, fair housing laws as well to make sure that we give full disclosure. We do not discriminate. We will not retaliate. If you feel that you have been discriminated against, we're not going to interfere. We're not going to retaliate against you because this is your choice to, if you feel you've been violated against, you don't need my permission to go and file a HUD with claim. I mean, <laughs> file a claim with HUD. It's almost break time. I just tied those words, switch those words around. All right, so this is why you wanna have a HUD poster that is posted in a readily accessible spot, which means don't put your poster in the kitchen behind the cabinet. You wanna post it so that all of your foot traffic, leads, prospects, residents are able to see that you are an equal opportunity provider. That is, that is all about transparency. Transparency, we understand fair housing laws, we adhere, we abide by those fair housing laws, and this is equal opportunity for housing at this community. Oh, here's my slide about retaliation. I actually just mentioned that at the very bottom of page number six. So I'm going to arrow forward from that because I've got a couple of workshops coming up now that we'll look at on page number seven. So hold on, please, because I want to grab something here. So on page number seven, I want everybody to take a look because we're going to look at the very first um, workshop. Hold, please. It says Mary lives at Holly Hills Senior Community and loves helping set up decorations for the holidays. She posted a flyer on the bulletin board by the mailboxes about the date and time of the Christmas party. She noticed it was immediately removed by management. When she approaches management to inquire why the information was removed, she was told that a majority of the residents are of Jewish faith and do not celebrate Christmas and they didn't want to offend anyone. What should management have done to avoid religious discrimination, which this absolutely is religious discrimination. So the community Holly Hills should allow residents to display and this is also based off of clear some very direct regulations for those at Will Hoyt Properties to just make sure you understand in this situation, how should you handle it based off your policy? It says Holly Hills, which again, this is the, the name of this community, should allow residents to display religious materials of any faith on the same basis. When we mentioned this before, that was in part of that Will Hoyt policy, as they can display non-religious materials. Be very clear that it's okay for the tenants to decorate their apartment doors, apartments, 
patios, balconies, etc., and display any of their specific religious beliefs and common areas in the same basis as tenants displaying non-religious items or decorations. Okay, so very, um, very specific guidance there. Again, going back to understanding about religious discrimination and how to apply your policies as Will Hoyt um, has outlined for you. Um, we saw it on a couple of slides and I had that insert that's in your manual. Eric and his family, here's the next example, and this is also on page seven. So Eric and his family stop by Auburndale Creek Apartments looking for a three bedroom apartment where there's only one three bedroom unit available. The leasing agent knows that the unit is located in a building with mostly older residents that do not want children living in the building. This is not intentionally done, it just happened by default. The leasing agent doesn't tell Eric and his family about the available unit and advises them to check back within a week to see what is available. Is the actions of the leasing agent correct? The actions of the leasing agent is absolutely incorrect. Why? Because they are discriminating on, against Eric and his family because there's children. Remember, we look, we don't, if we discriminate against someone because they have a child, children, they're pregnant, they are under 18, um, they're adopting children or they have foster children, we are committing a violation of familial status. We place individuals, we house them based on what their need is, based on what we have available. The leasing agent should tell Eric about that unit and go tour that, um, the touring is optional, but that's how we showcase our properties, you know, our units, and that helps that person, you know, picture themselves living there. So if it's in your policy, of course, to tour them in the unit, then you do that. Um, but you do not go ahead and, and tell them, you do not falsely uh, give them, and that goes back to the prohibited acts as well. You cannot tell them about false availability because you're telling them you don't have something when actually you do. You just don't feel it'll work out because it'll disturb the harmony in that building since they're mostly seniors that live there and Eric has children. Nope, we need to go and make sure that um, if they meet the standards, of the program and any occupancy rules and they qualify to live there. Let's look at the next one with Edward. It says Edward lives in Jennings housing and he's also the reverend at a local church. He posted the days and times of church service on everyone's apartment doors, hoping they will visit and fellowship with him. Charles, another resident, took the advertising straight to the manager, demanding answers as to why is this allowed? How should the manager handle that situation? Well, here's how an example of understanding and adhering to religious discrimination in, a, in an instance like this, based on, again, off of the policies too that are in place, specifically whatever Will Hoyt's, what Will Hoyt's policies are, it says the manager should call Edward to the office and explain how religious advertising ties into fair housing laws and re regulations. He should be provided an equal opportunity. Notice that word is equal. Equal opportunity to host or participate in religious activities on site on the same basis as non-religious activities. Remember, equal that Will Hoyt policy I stressed to you was about equal opportunity for everyone. While his plan means well, advertising on the other tenants' doors is strictly prohibited as this is their personal space. Okay, so it's important to um, understand what the policies are with regards to religious violation. However, notice Eric did say, what did he do? He posted the days and times of church service on everyone's apartment door. The last line of guidance I, I wanted to stress, it says, while his plan means well, so while Edward meant well, advertising on other tenants' doors is strictly prohibited as this is their personal space. So you get your lease uh, requirements, your policies for occupancy that you have to adhere to, but you also have to be aware of understanding the religious uh, discrimination protections under the Fair Housing Act. So this one kind of fuses together two different, um, uh, two different views into which to look at, the, to which the manager would handle the situation. Let's look at the next one. All right, this one is about Wendell. 
Wendell is a resident, so last one on page number seven. Wendell is a resident at Shore Acres Apartments and he's an avid reader. He frequently visits the library at his community to see what is available to read. Now, during one of his visits, he notices that a Bible isn't part of the collection and decides to donate one of his own. Management notices the Bible and feels that and feels this is inappropriate and removes it from the library. Was management correct in their actions? Here's what I want you to understand. And again, this is based on understanding too what your policies are. What, what does my management company direct me to do in a situation like this. Religious materials of any faith, including religious publications shall also be permitted. Notice says also be permitted to the same extent as non-religious materials in common areas. So this is not just a policy created by your company. It's a policy based on those fair housing laws that we are going to apply to our company and our communities must adhere to it with our residents. For example, residents shall be permitted to contribute religious materials of all faiths, remember being inclusive, to a property's library on the same basis as residents are permitted to contribute non-religious materials. Got to make sure you understand the rules and regulations of not only the, the Fair Housing Act, but how does your company speak to that and how do you apply it properly to all of those that live at the community to be consistent and fair to all. All right, so we've got about five minutes. Let's look at a little bit more before we take our first break. Turn now to page number nine. Uh, we had a, a blank page in there that was intentionally left blank. I think it was page number eight, but let's look at page nine because we're going to look at our maintenance professionals because maintenance, our maintenance teams are so important to our communities. Our communities would be lost without them. We need maintenance and we need strong maintenance teams. Maintenance staff provides a crucial service to our residents by ensuring that the community and the apartments are well maintained. I mentioned just a few minutes ago that your maintenance staff will actually come into contact. They come into contact with residents uh, and prospects more than you do because they're always out on the property. They're coming, going in and out of units, you know, fulfilling work orders. So it's important that your maintenance staff um, has frequent or, or annual, I won't say frequent, but annual uh, fair housing training because they need to understand the rules and regulations as well because they are um, acting on behalf of the owner of the property. They are on the, uh, whether they have that management title or not, they are responsible for compliance at the property and you are counting on them to understand the rules and regulations of their job and um, abide, adhere to those rules and regulations. So if your maintenance teams um, have not received fair housing training, I may have some on this training between today and tomorrow, but it's important that you make sure whether they've been at the property for two days, two weeks, two months, two years, 20 years, everyone should have fair housing training at least once a year. And Zephyr and Associates, we have, we offer fair housing several times throughout um, the course of a year. We'll, we'll have um, the same uh, four hour fair housing class, and we have one that's specifically geared for maintenance staff. It's important though, to also have written policies regarding the following services or procedures. Your maintenance of the property, such as maintaining your common areas or your grounds areas, that curb appeal, but, but what are your policies for your maintenance teams? Annual inspections, move in, move out inspections, work orders, after hour emergencies, these are very important for understanding for your maintenance teams, how are work orders, let's say you have somebody new, let's say you hire someone new, this is their first time um, as a maintenance tech and you outline to them what your policies and procedures are for work orders. You may have a, your company policy, maybe the resident has to go through the resident portal um, or they have to, you know, you may not have a resident portal in a particular community. It's by way of picking up the phone and calling and placing a work order, walking in and telling someone, hey, look, I've got a leaky faucet in my sec in my uh, one of my bedrooms, bathrooms, excuse me, whatever that is. They need to know how a work order is accepted, how, what is the procedure for the time that they are entered into the system, which ones take priority. Some um, work orders are going to take priority over the another, such as you may have um, a light bulb that's in the vault of the ceiling 
that needs to be changed, or you may have um, an HVAC issue in a unit. The HVAC issue is going to take precedence over that light bulb that's out. After hours emergencies, what is your management practice for defining what are after hour emergencies and how are they processed? How are they handled? How are they prioritized? Having these policies and procedures in place will go a long way in helping demonstrate that management is providing these services in a non-discriminatory manner. Remember, documenting, having a policy in place, aids in consistency that everyone is following the rules and not cherry picking well i don't feel like getting on a ladder and you know changing the bulb and that and that that light that's in in the vault i'd much rather go and unclog the garbage disposal that may be our preference for the day but you have to have a part you can't do that have a priority or saying well miss sarah's so sweet and she doesn't ever put in work orders i think i'm just going to go ahead and and, and go to her unit and, and take care of this leaky faucet for and I'll get to that other uh, work order next. Meanwhile, the other work order came in first. So those are things you wanna make sure you're, you're careful of. Having a policy and procedures in place will go a long way in helping demonstrate that management is providing them in a non-discriminatory manner, but just by having these policies and writing is not enough. You've gotta be consistent and enforce them and follow them, okay? But you are, allow to, um, you have to allow for reasonable accommodation when it's requested. All right, everyone, it is right at 1.30. So it is break.